Hello, my dear students. On this module, we start discussion of chemotherapy. So it will be introduction to chemotherapy and we'll be discussing penicillins. If you look at this slide, I'm taking you back to 1918. That is a period of World War I. And why I'm taking you to this? Because at the time of World War I, especially in the World War I, if you get a gunshot wound, it used to be meant as gangrene. There was no antibiotic available. There was no antimicrobial agent available if there could be infection. So in, the do in those days, 1918, 1920, infection means gangrene, infection means amputation, infection means septicemia and death because there was no antibiotic available. This was called as the pre-antibiotic era. And you can imagine how the people would have lived in the pre-antibiotic era. Much, much later, after these years, there came antimicrobial agents, there came antibiotics, and the antimicrobial agents derived from non-microorganism source. We need to understand the terminology. What is an antimicrobial agent? A drug which is going to inhibit the growth or going to kill a microorganism is an antimicrobial agent. If this antimicrobial agent is obtained from a microorganism, then you call it an antibiotic. Let me repeat, if an antimicrobial agent is obtained from the source of microorganism, then you classically call it antibiotic. So there could be some antimicrobial agents which are just chemically prepared in a laboratory. They are just synthesized. Then classically we don't call them antibiotic. We call them just antimicrobial agent. It's an antimicrobial from non-microorganism sovers. So this is a small difference between the classic definition of antibiotic and antimicrobial agent. What is chemotherapy? In the initial days, the meaning of chemotherapy was simple. It's treating the diseases with the help of drugs. Why we are highlighting with the help of drugs? Because it means that you are trying to avoid the surgery. You are trying to avoid an invasive procedure. Then it's called chemo. Chemo is drugs. Treat a disease with the help of drugs. Later on, this word chemotherapy came into use, especially for management of infections as well as the infestations that those are produced by the worms or the helminths. So later on chemotherapy started having a meaning that when, when we are speaking about the treatment of infections and infestations, then we should call it chemotherapy. Much later, one more matter was added to this and this was cancers or treatment of malignancy. You must have heard the word layman using a term chemo, he's on chemo and when he's saying chemo, it means is talking about cancer chemotherapy. So now in general, chemotherapy would mean treatment of infections, infestations, cancers, everything is called chemotherapy. Let's go to important landmarks of chemotherapy. You can have a look at this slide. In the year 1877, Louis Pasteur told us a principle, life destroys life. You know the original thought was the higher animals kill the lower animal and similarly, another thought emerged, that's life destroyed life. How did he say it? He found that bacteria prevented growth of anthrax bacillus in urine. And then he felt probably a bacterium is able to kill another bacterium. So he said life destroys life. That's 1877, Louis Pasteur. 1891, it was shown that methylene blue inhibited the growth of bacteria. Methylene blue is a dye and it was shown that it could inhibit the growth of bacteria. This was shown by Paul Ehrlich. So probably first time we had an evidence that you could destroy the bacteria by using something. And this is why Paul Ehrlich who received Nobel in 1909 is called as father of modern chemotherapy. The next important landmark came in 1928. It was shown that the fungus Penicillium notatum could inhibit Staphylococci in a culture plate of fungus inhibiting a bacterium, a microorganism. And this was shown by Alexander Fleming in 1928 
This is the most important landmark. In 1938, a scientist named Domag showed that prontocell, which is also a dye, inhibited microorganism. Not only this, in 1938, from with the help of prontocell, some compounds were prepared, whom we call today as sulfonamides or sulfur drugs. And the first substance came in that was called sulfonylamide. So if someone asks you what's the first antimicrobial agent of this world, that's sulfonylamide. That came in 1938. And this was not from microorganisms. This was not an antibiotic. It was from chemical source. Then in 1941 came penicillin. You can understand what tremendous amount of effort and hard work the scientists might have done to bring penicillin. In 1928 it was first shown that there could be a substance like this and it has taken 14 long years to bring penicillin to market. Alexander Fleming, Fleury and Chain, they received Nobel in 1941 for penicillin. And this entrance of penicillin started producing a revolution in the management of infections. Let's go to know what are the organisms, various organisms. It's very essential to know at the beginning of the therapy, at the beginning of chemotherapy, what are the types of organisms. Look at the slide, I've just brought in a, a, a list of microorganisms. I'll read it out for you. Bacteria, fungi, viruses, spirochetes, that's treponemes and Morelia, actinomyces, rickettsi, chlamydia and mycoplasma, three a typical type of organisms, then nocardia, then protozoa or parasites which include amoeba, giardia, trichomonas, toxoplasma and malarial parasite. Then you also have worms or helminths in the parasites and lastly prions. So look at this particular list. Some of them are actually on the borderline of the bacterium or virus but I have put them separately for example nocardia, actinomyces so that we don't forget these important organisms. So let's revise once again. Bacteria, fungi, viruses, spirochetes, actinomyces, three atypical organisms Rickettsi, Chlamydia and Mycoplasma. Then you have Nocardia. Protozoa or Parasites including Amoeba, Giardia, Trichomonas, Toxoplasma and Malarial Parasite and Worms or Helminths and Prions. After the list of microorganisms, I hope you know the bacteria could be stained by Gram staining or Acid staining that is Zeal Nelson staining and you could have Gram positive or gram negative organisms and you could have acid fast bacilli. Those are the Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium lepri, the very common ones. Now let's go on to see what are the gram positive organisms. There's a nice list here of gram positive organisms. Let's see the list. Staphylococcus, especially important is aureus. Streptococcus, very dense. Pneumococcus, which is a type of streptococcus, that's Diplococcus pneumoniae. Cornibacterium diphtheri, Clostridia, that's Clostridium welchii, Tetany, Botulinum, Perfringens, and very important, Clostridium difficile. Next you have Bacillus anthracis, then Listeria, which produces respiratory and skin infections, and Erysipelothrix, which is known to produce respiratory infections. After having a look at the list of gram positive organisms, I have a table for you. The first column is showing you the organism. The second column is telling us what are the common infections, common diseases produced by these organisms. So let's start with Staph aureus, the first row, Staphylococcus aureus, mainly produces skin and superficial tissue infections, MM is mucous membranes get affected, gastrointestinal tract infections, then respiratory infections and pneumonia, urinary tract infections, meningitis and the cardiac infections, the endocardial infections. Streptococcus, very dense, is the next organism. 
you have skin, superficial tissues, wounds, mucous membranes, then GIT, burns, respiratory infections like pneumonia, streptococcus also produces urinary tract infection. Then I hope you know there are some post-streptococcal illnesses and lastly meningitis. So if you look at this staphylococcus and streptococcus, I hope you understand skin, superficial tissue, mucous membranes, gastrointestinal tract, urinary tract, the commonly exposed mucous membranes are more involved. Pneumococcus is a type of streptococcus and it will definitely produce the similar kind of infections, especially respiratory tract infections, pneumonia. It can also lead to meningitis and superficial tissue and skin infections. Next in order, cornimbactam diphtheri produces diphtheria, bacillus anthracis produces anthrax. The next organism is Clostridium, which has got many species, for example, see Clostridium titani, Welchai, Botulinum, Perfringens and Difficile. Clostridium titani responsible for tetanus and the other ones responsible for wound infections, food poisoning and gas gangrene. And a highlighted organism here is Clostridium difficile. It's an opportunistic organism and it prevails when you start using broad spectrum antimicrobial agents when the commensals get killed and the Clostridium difficile starts multiplying to produce pseudomembranous enterocolitis. You got to remember Clostridium difficile induced pseudomembranous enterocolitis which happens as a super infection. Lastly, on this slide, there's Listeria which is known to produce meningitis and encephalitis as well as endocarditis, neonatal sepsis and septicemia. So that's regarding the gram-positive organisms. Whenever you want to imagine a spectrum, antibacterial spectrum of an antimicrobial agent, always think of what are the gram-positive affected and always start with this list, this order so that you're not going to miss anything. So it will be like Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Pneumococcus, then always say about Cornibactin diphtheri and Bacillus anthracis. Then talk about Clostridium, that's Titani, Welchai, etc. and Difficile. And finally, Listeria.